Good afternoon, everyone. You guys doing okay? Yes, yes, we're glad that you're here. We want to welcome you, and can we give a welcome to our online audience who is joining us as well today? Uh, we are excited to have Dr. Wilkinson with us, and I want to thank the Murdoch Trust for helping fund this lecture today. They uh, have provided some of the funds that are helping a lecture today as well as tomorrow. He'll be lecturing at Multnomah University as well. So can we give some love to the Murdoch Trust as well? <laughs> Dr. David Wilkinson is uh, a, a man of many talents. He is an uh, astrophysicist, he is a theologian, he is a Methodist minister, but more than anything else, he is a man with a heart for God and God's people. And one of the things that I appreciate the most about him is that he sees this dialogue between faith and science not as faith being uh, an enemy of science or having uh, this antagonistic relationship, but actually in conversation with science. And because of that, he has a passion to see people who are followers of Jesus engage science in a way that not only encourages your faith, but moves us into the fields of scientific discovery so that we can have a voice as well in those vocations. And so without further ado, would you please welcome Dr. David Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Rick, and thank you for the hospitality of this church, which has been delightful. Um, it's lovely to be here, and just one more thank you from me, and that's uh, my friend Paul Irvin, who uh, is the man who's probably introducing himself to you all. Uh, he looks after me while I'm in the US, and I owe a great deal to him. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Rick. It reminded me of uh, a few years ago. I was on a train from where I live, which is in the northeast of England, to London. It takes about uh, three hours or so. And I sat down, and the person beside me introduced themselves. And they said, what do you do? Well, I said, uh, I'm a Methodist minister and a theologian. Um, I'm always hesitant about saying that to people because you never quite know what people's reaction will be. And this man's eyes seemed to fill with fear as he thought to himself, oh no, three hours sitting beside a religious fanatic. So he quickly tried to change the topic of conversation. He said, what did you do before that? Well, I said I did research in theoretical astrophysics. This time his eyes glazed as he thought to himself, uh, well, what's that? But it's something to do with science. And so he asked me the question that many people have asked over the years, how can you be a scientist and a Christian? Or the subtext is, how can you be a scientist and a Christian with integrity? Uh, because we could view what we do as cr those of us who are Christians as something that we do on Sundays and then we do science Monday to Saturday for the rest of the week. But it seems to me that if we're going to do it with integrity, if Jesus is Lord of all, as Christians say, then he's Lord of not just my heart, but my mind. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the joy of being both a scientist and a Christian, not that it solves every answer, um, but it makes me joyful both about Christian faith and about the joy of science. But I also want to recognize that we live in a culture which often puts the two in conflict. Now, I'm a great fan of the Big Bang Theory. I mean, not just the scientific theory, but the American comedy series um, uh, where you know Sheldon, the great physicist, uh, has this interesting relationship with her mother, with his mother, a six-day creationist from Texas. And the spin-off series, Young Sheldon, puts this young Sheldon Cooper as a scientific genius 
in a constant conversation with Pastor Jeff, the pastor of his local church. And this is the first time that uh, Pastor Jeff and Sheldon encounter each other. Sometimes people say to me, Pastor Jeff, how do you know there's a God? And I say it's simple math. God either exists or he doesn't. So let's be cynical. Worst case scenario, there's a 50-50 chance. And I like those odds. That's wrong. Shelly, put your hand down. Sorry, please continue. It's okay, Mary. It's Sheldon, right? Yes, sir. Well, Sheldon, why don't you come on up here and tell me how I'm wrong? No. Okay. Let's give him a hand, everybody. What's happening? Shelly's going to eat him alive. <laughs> so, you were saying? You've confused possibilities with probabilities. According to your analogy, when I go home, I might find a million dollars on my bed, or I might not. In what universe is that 50-50? So, what do you think the odds are that God exists? I think there's zero. I believe in science. So, you don't think science and religion can go hand in hand? Science is fact. Religion is faith. I prefer facts. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Here's a cool fact for you. A lot of famous scientists believed in God. Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, even Charles Darwin. So Darwin's right about God and wrong about evolution? Now you're getting it. Let's give it up for Sheldon, everybody. What a good sport. Oh. But I wasn't a good sport. At that moment, I vowed to come back the following Sunday and destroy Pastor Jeff. Now, let me just say, unfortunately, I'm not going to be here next Sunday. Um, but we are going to have a question and answer time, which uh, Rick and John are going to lead. And um, I, I, at that point, I can be destroyed in all of this. But that kind of image, which is in the popular media of uh, conflict between science and religion, is not the whole story. When Stephen Hawking um, published this book, A Brief History of Time, uh, and sold 10 million copies worldwide, and then followed it up with the grand design, uh, Carl Sagan, in his introduction to A Brief History of Time, said, this is a, a book about God, or perhaps about the absence of God. That reinforced that kind of sense that science is about the absence of God. But Hawking isn't the only cosmologist who talks about this, these things. Paul Davis, um, a distinguished cosmologist, wrote in the 1980s, in my opinion, science offers a surer path to God than religion. An absence of God or a surer path? I'm going to kind of wonder in the middle of some of this. But I hope it's going to be an exciting middle to wander through. And I thought I'd take my own experience as a theoretical astrophysicist. You all know what that is, don't you? It's very easy. It's twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. That's basically astrophysics. The only trouble is that astrophysicists respond up above the world so high a contracting ball of hot hydrogen gas undergoing nuclear fusion. It doesn't quite scan in the same way, um, but I've been interested in how stars evolve, how galaxies evolve, and where the universe itself comes from uh, in the model of the Big Bang. So uh, what I thought I'd do is first of all just introduce you to the universe very quickly. Um, it's a big place. Secondly, we'll talk about our current accepted model of the origin of the universe, the Big Bang model. And then thirdly, what I'd like to do is um, share with you some of the big questions that have come out of the science. Now, these are philosophical, theological questions, which have been raised not by just those of us who come from faith communities, but by scientists outside faith communities who see some of the big questions. Okay, is that all right with everyone? I mean, I hope it is, because that's what I've prepared, and if it's not, then we're in a bit of a problem, but uh, let's see how we go. Um, 
So this is uh, one of my favorite galaxies at the moment. It's GN711. Astronomers have great imagination sometimes in naming their galaxies. And this galaxy is very small. It's only probably a few hundred million stars, which is uh, quite small as a galaxy. But its significance, and here's a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it uh, is one of the furthest objects in the universe that we've ever seen. So the light from this galaxy has taken over 13 billion years to reach us. The light from the sun takes about eight minutes to reach England. Um, uh, sorry, eight seconds, what am I talking about? It's been a lot, I've still got jet lag. Um, the light from this galaxy has taken over 13 billion years to reach us. Now that not only tells you that the universe is very large, we also are seeing that galaxy as it was over 13 billion years ago when the light set off from it. So the universe is very old, it seems, from this. And in fact, we can draw a little picture of this. Here's Hubble looking out into the universe. In the next couple of years, I'm going to have to get a new slide with the James Webb telescope looking out. And as you look back, and that picture that I've just shown you is from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, as it's called, that's where the galaxy is. You look back in time in terms of the age of the universe. Some people say, will we ever be able to see right back to the beginning of the universe itself? Well, unfortunately, you see where the Dark Ages is. That's where the universe becomes cloudy and we can't see any further. But maybe with gravitational waves we might be able to see further, but that's another story at the moment. So we've got a universe. Well, let me show you this slightly differently. This is a, a clip called Powers of Ten. And some of you will have seen this before. What we're going to do is go on a journey through the universe, and we're going to expand the size of the picture by a power of 10 every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, we're going to be further away from the couple having the picnic in the park. At the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a distance scale of about 100 meters. On the right-hand side of the screen is a mathematical notation of writing the same thing. If you don't understand that, just smile and this, it'll impress your neighbor. Um, and as we begin to move through the universe, so you begin to see the universe at different perspectives, and you see different structures within the universe. So at this point, where we need an Apollo rocket or um, something from Bezos or Elon Musk to get out of the atmosphere. Um, you look back and you see this big expanse of water. Uh, you should be able to start seeing the continent of North America emerging. And at this point, we begin to leave the Earth's atmosphere and look back on this beautiful blue planet in the vastness of space, our home, the Earth. In a moment, you'll see a line extend horizontally across the screen. That'll be the true speed of light at this perspective. And that shows you how quickly light travels. There it is. That ellipse is the orbit of the moon, about 240,000 miles from the Earth. They tell me that that's the typical distance that a human being walks in their lifetime. I have no idea how they calculate that, by the way, but I read it on Wikipedia, so it must be true, I suppose. This is the orbit of the Earth, and we'll remind ourselves that the Earth is one planet. Beside us are some neighbors, rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars. Now the orbits of the outer planets, big gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And this piece of video is so old that even the orbit of Pluto is on this picture. Most of us don't think Pluto's a planet anymore. But anyway, we're now moving through a vast cloud of comets. Millions and millions of comets called the Oort Cloud, so small you can't see them. It was a disturbance in these comets, it's thought, that led to the dinosaur extinction about 65 million years or so ago. 
the constellations would look exactly as they do on the, from the surface of the earth. That's because the stars are so far away from us. Uh, we've run out of space, if you forgive the pun, on the left-hand side of the screen. So we're now talking about distances in light years. This is the distance that it would take light a year to travel. We're doing in just a few seconds. At about 10 to 100 light years, you begin to see our sun in a galaxy called the Milky Way galaxy, a collection of 100 billion stars. I wonder if you can see some kind of grayish, purplish clouds as well. These are vast maternity hospitals for stars. They'll give birth to about 10,000 stars or so um, at a time. And this is our home, the Milky Way galaxy, as we'd see it if we went outside of it. Spiral pattern of gas and dust and stars. And uh, now we're going to see the universe on the scale of galaxies. So each dot of light is typically going to be a galaxy of 100 billion stars or so. Um, galaxies cluster together. And we're part of a Virgo cluster. Uh, you'll see it just moving past the screen there. And understanding how galaxies cluster is very important for understanding the very origin of the universe itself. Uh, as I said in the morning sermon, there are about, we think, about 100 billion galaxies. So that means if you multiply 100 billion by 100 billion, that's something like one followed by 22 zeros is the number of stars in the universe. Those of you who are Christians will remember some of the biblical images. The heaven declare the glory of God. The extravagance and diversity of a creator God. Now, we're going back we're going much quicker because you've seen the animation on the way out, okay? So let's make our way back to the solar system. And this is the uh, inner solar system. And if our aim is good enough, we should find our way back to the Earth. And, uh, and if our parachute is big enough, we'll find our way back to Chicago, to the waterfront, where there are a couple of people having a picnic. You can tell by the way they're dressed what decade this movie was made in. And you can tell by the way that I'm dressed what decade I'm still stuck in. <laughs> what we're going to do, because science is really interesting today in the way that the very big and the very small are connected, we're going to continue our journey, this time making the picture smaller by a factor of 10 every 10 seconds. So we're going to go into the man's hand and see what we can find. Well, at about one centimeter squared, you see some layers of skin. It's not terribly interesting. You can probably discern that by looking at the back of your own hand. But let's make the picture smaller. Well, you now begin to see blood vessels. Let's go inside the blood vessels. That's a white blood cell. We go inside the white blood cell. That's the cell nucleus. Inside the cell nucleus, you begin to see emerging the spiral coils of DNA, part of the stuff that makes us, us. DNA is a very complex molecule, but we're going to look at one atom in that molecule. It's going to be an atom of carbon. It's going to appear in the center of the screen. And let's focus the picture on that atom of carbon. And we're going to go inside the carbon atom. Now, the first thing we encounter are electrons. And in this animation, they're shown to be fuzzy. That's because of quantum theory. We haven't got time to do quantum theory in detail this afternoon. Praise the Lord, everyone says. But we're moving through the electrons, and you'll remember that the atomic nucleus is very small. If it was the size of a soccer ball, the atom would be the size of a, a soccer stadium. Uh, in carbon's case, the atomic nucleus, here it is, is made up of protons and neutrons. And the protons and neutrons are made up of things called quarks, 
We can't really show you what quarks are like because there's a particular nuclear force which keeps them stuck in there. We can't rip them out. And whew, that's about the end of our current knowledge of the universe as such. Now, you may have seen that piece of video before. I've seen it many times. I have to say, it still fills me with awe and amazement at the nature of the universe. But if I then said to you that over 13 billion years ago, 13.8 billion years ago, everything that I've shown you, the 100 billion stars and 100 billion galaxies, all of it was small enough to fit through the eye of a needle. At that point, the universe began with a rapid expansion of space-time. Fred Hoyle, a great physicist, didn't like the theory. He nicknamed it the Big Bang. He said it has all the elegance of a girl jumping out of a cake at a birthday party. The nickname stuck, and ever since it's been called the Big Bang. And on my next slide, I hope you're ready for this, I've tried to give the whole history of the universe on one slide. Forgive me for being so bold. Here it is. Our current age is 13.8 billion years. Some of us feel it more than others at times, <laughs> particularly if we've tr crossed the Atlantic on an aeroplane. And what our current models of physics allow us to do is to understand, we think, what the universe was like when we go back in time. So we think that our current models of physics work and give us a good description of the universe when it was only one million years old. Forgive me, this is not to scale. In fact, we think we know what the universe was like when it was only one second old. And if that isn't sufficient, we think our current models of physics work pretty well back to 10 to the minus 43 of a second. Now, that's a shorthand way of writing 1 followed by 10 followed by 42 zeroths of a second. Now, if you're a biologist or an engineer or a normal person, if you know what I mean by that, you'll probably say that's zero, isn't it? Well, not quite. At that point, our current laws of physics break down. And it's really frustrating, to be honest. It's like you've been watching a murder mystery on the television for three hours. And just before the murderer is revealed, someone FaceTimes you, and you miss the end of the movie. Just before you get to the very beginning of the universe, our current laws of physics break down. I'll come back to that in a moment. The universe is very young, it's very small. A fraction of a centimeter across, it begins to expand rapidly. As it expands, it cools. 10 to the minus 35 of a second, quarks appear in the universe. Between one second and a thousand seconds, protons and neutrons appear in the universe. And then to cut a very long story short, out of great clouds of molecular hydrogen, stars appear and galaxies appear in the universe. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, mm, uh, yeah, but how do you know it's true? As the Lord said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? I could say the same thing to scientists. Now, of course, cosmology isn't like lots of other kinds of science. You can't ask a young person in a high school to explode a universe in a Big Bang. Some of them attempt to do that from time to time, but you can't ask to do it, it's a one-off. And so what um, cosmology is like, it's rather like my favorite detective, is Miss Marple, Agatha Christie's Miss Marple. When Miss Marple comes on the scene of a crime, she hasn't seen the crime happen. What she has to do is look for various clues or pieces of evidence to reconstruct what she thinks happened. And that's what scientists do when it comes to the origin of the universe. And three pieces of evidence were important in the 20th century. We won't go through them in detail. The first was that we saw that the light from distant galaxies was redder than it should be. 
and that indicated that the galaxies were moving away from us. The second was in 1965, the discovery of a form of radiation called the microwave background radiation that now pervades the whole of space. And the third piece of evidence had to wait till the 1980s, when the amount of helium in the universe um, agreed well with predictions from the Big Bang. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that the Big Bang is proved. When you talk about science at this level, big science, actually you don't use the word proof. You talk about the best model which interprets the evidence, um, and you are open to evidence continuing and models adapting. But it has to be said that as times have gone on, we've been able to confirm the Big Bang conceptually is pretty good. It's not proved, but it's a pretty good model. And we've been able to look at the microwave background radiation, which has confirmed some of this, but it's also reminded us of some of the big unanswered questions that we have. So let me share those with you. Uh, the first is that there's a kind of matter in the universe which we know is there because it affects gravitationally other things, but it doesn't give out any light. And we don't know what it is. It's called the dark matter. And about 20, 23% of the universe is in the form of dark matter. So 23% of the universe, we don't actually know what it is. Now, if that isn't embarrassing, another 73% of the universe is in the form of dark energy. And we call it dark energy because, to be honest, we have no idea what it is. Now, you don't have to be a great mathematician to work out. That means that we don't know what 96% of the universe is made of. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, why have they brought this bloke from England if he doesn't know what 96% of the universe is made of? Well, yes, but we know that we only know what 96, you know, we only know 4%. But that shows you just how this is a work in progress in lots of ways. But the other problem with the Big Bang that we have is, do you remember when I said the laws of physics break down at 10 to the minus 43 of a second? And the problem with that is the problem of two of the great theories of 20th century physics, general relativity and quantum theory. And we're left with a question mark there. Now, in order to explain this to you in the next 30 seconds, I need to explain to you both general relativity and quantum theory. Are you ready for this? <laughs> yes, thank you. At least there was one hoop and holler. Uh, let's do it like this. General relativity, discovered by Albert Einstein, describes the universe on the very largest of scales planets, galaxies, the universe itself, and every way you apply it, it works beautifully to explain gravity. Quantum theory, and here's one of its discoverers, Niels Bohr, describes the universe on the very smallest of scale. It describes atoms and electrons. And most of the time, quantum theory works down here, and general relativity works over here, and the two never meet. But there is one point in the universe's history where they both want a piece of the action. Remember, 10 to the minus 43 of a second, the whole universe is very small. Oh, says general relativity, you're talking about the whole universe here, that's my area. Hold on, says quantum theory. The universe is very small, very small is my area, and the trouble is that the two theories don't agree. They are inconsistent at the moment. And that's why people like Professor Hawkins and others have been pursuing a quantum theory of gravity, a theory to bring about um, a way of describing the very early universe which would encompass general relativity and quantum theory. And it's very, very um, frustrating. Robert Jastrow, a number of years ago, he... Uh, he wrote a book about God and the astronomers. He was a NASA astrophysicist, and he wrote this. For the scientist who has lived by faith in the power of reason, 
the story ends like a bad dream. They've scaled the mountains of ignorance and just about, they're about to pull themselves over the final peak, they're greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. That was Jastrow's view. Now, just be careful for a moment. In case we move too quickly to saying, God is the answer to this. And let me just also, not too quickly, but I need to pause and just say that within the Christian church, different Christians have different views on these matters. Some Christians read the first few chapters of the book of Genesis as a scientific textbook. And they would say that the universe is not a few billion years old, but a few thousand years old. This is the position of six-day creationism. Other Christians, equally committed to the authority of Scripture, say, no, the first chapters of Genesis are not a scientific text. They're a theological text. They're there to tell us who God is, not how He did it. In fact, uh, as you probably picked up so far, my own position is in that latter view. And if you pushed me, I actually think that Genesis 1 is not a scientific text. I think it's a song of worship. So, Rick, if you'd invited the writer of Genesis to come and address this uh, august body of people, and you asked the writer of Genesis, how old is the universe? I think the writer of Genesis would say, to be honest, I'm not really interested in that. What I'm interested in is that you get excited at just how great God is. Now, let's all stand together and sing His praises together. I think that's what Genesis 1 actually is. It's a, a wonderful song of worship. But I just want to acknowledge that Christians believe different things on this. Um, and I'm reminded of the words of Galileo. The Scriptures are meant to tell us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And sometimes the Christian church has fallen out with each other on this matter. And not only have we forgotten what the primary goal of Scripture is, but also in our conversation or arguing with each other, it's drowned out the voices of those outside the church who have said, all of this Big Bang stuff is raising some really interesting theological questions. So, in this last part, don't worry, we're in the last part of the talk now. We've only got another three hours to go, so you're all right. This last part of the talk, I want to go to the questions raised by cosmology. The questions, we've done the universe, we've done the Big Bang. Now, what are the big questions that scientists are asking? The first is this, and it's the question of origins. Does the Big Bang prove God? You've probably heard an argument which goes something like this. If the universe began with a Big Bang, isn't God the one who sets off the explosion, who lights the blue touch paper of the explosion? Well, um, it's an uh, argument that was used by Pius the Twelfth. I'm sorry, by the way, that in translating from Britain to America, my God has got squeezed out in a rather odd way. I'll come back to that in a moment. You insert God as the explanation. Uh, Pius XII used it, and also an Oxford physicist called E. A. Milne, not A. A. Milne, by the way, but E. A. Milne, who wrote a book on general relativity, a beautiful book on the expansion of the universe, at the end of the book he wrote. Um, but the first cause of the, of the universe is left for the reader to insert. But our story is incomplete without him. Now, is this a good argument for the existence of God? I have to say to you, I'm not convinced. Uh, there are problems with the logic here. What comes before the Big Bang, and how does that relate to time? Can you use cause and effect in this kind of way? But more importantly for me as a Christian, the problem with this argument runs a problem of something called the God of the Gaps. This is uh, where if science has a gap in it, 
beware of inserting God as the explanation into that gap. Because as increasingly science explains its own realm, what happens to that God? God is pushed out of the gap and becomes irrelevant. Now, I do not believe in a God like that. I do not believe in a God who hides in the little gaps of human ignorance. The God that I see in Jesus is not like that. And in fact, that kind of argument often leads to something called deism. Now, the deists believed in a God who started off the universe and then retired a safe distance for a cup of tea. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible isn't described as reaching out his hand and starting the whole thing off. The God of the Bible is described as the one who holds the universe in the palm of his hand, keeping it in existence moment by moment. God is not the one who smashes a champagne bottle against the hull of the universe and pushes it out to sea, saying, cheerio, folks, see you on Judgment Day. The God of the New Testament, as we saw this morning in Colossians, is the one who, in whom all things cohere, keeping the universe afloat, keeping it together. So for me, the God of Christian understanding isn't the God just of the 10 to the minus 43 of a second. He's the God of every moment of the universe's history whether every second or every billion years, because this is the God who sustains the universe moment by moment. And therefore, when Stephen Hawking in A Brief History of Time comes along and says, I might be able to fill in the first 10 to the minus 43 of a second, if you believe in a God of the gaps or a deistic God, God is pushed out. But if you have a more Christian view of God, there's a sense in which you can say, um, praise the Lord for such a lovely explanation of the first few moments of the universe's history. And if Professor Hawkins says that the universe came through a quantum fluctuation, then the Christian or the philosopher can say, terrific, but where does quantum theory itself come from? You see, science doesn't explain where the laws of physics come from. It assumes that they're there. That's a metaphysical or philosophical question. Sorry, I'm going on a bit too long. Is everyone all right so far? The second question is the question of purpose, and that's the flip side. And that is, does the Big Bang disprove God? And you've probably heard this argument as well. Science uh, tells me that the universe came through a Big Bang. Uh, theology tells me it comes through the sovereign act of God, and then people pause for a moment and says, now which are you going to choose? And in fact, Professor Richard Dawkins uses this. He says, once I've got a scientific description of the universe, that's all I need. It seems to me that that's just a little too simplistic with respect. Let me take an old illustration. What is a kiss? Well, a kiss is the approach of two pairs of lips, the reciprocal transmission of carbon dioxide and microbes, and the juxtaposition of two orbicular muscles in a state of contraction. That's a scientific description of a kiss. But if I go to my wife, Alison, when I get back from the US and I go up to her and say, Darling, let's get together for a mutual transmission of carbon dioxide and microbes. Let me juxtapose my orbicular muscle in a state of contraction with yours. She would say, get lost. <laughs> you see, in that context with my wife, the science is true, but it's not sufficient. In that context with my wife, I need to talk about purpose, meaning, value. So a scientific description is good, but it's not complete. And to fully understand what a kiss is about, I need all of those descriptions. And so it seems to me when we come to the origin of the universe, we are left with the question of why or meaning or value or purpose, even if we've got a scientific description of the thing. The third question is the question of design. 
And you might say, okay, you can't prove God through science, you can't disprove th God through science. Is there anything that might point towards a creator God? And the answer to that is going to be yes, possibly, perhaps for some. There are things about the universe which are intriguing. Things like anthropic balances, or to use Goldilocks, that the universe is just right for carbon-based life. That the law and circumstance of the universe is just right. I mentioned Fred Hoyle earlier, here he is. In the 1960s, he was an atheist, and he then began some work on how carbon and oxygen are produced in the death throes of stars, supernova explosions. And what he discovered was that uh, the energy levels in carbon, if they were 2% different from what they are, and if the energy levels in oxygen were only half a percent different from what they are, there would be no carbon in the universe. And that's quite important for you and I because we're made of the stuff. And he wrote after that, nothing has shaken my atheism as much as this discovery. Now, we need to be careful in that some will say, Maybe there are many universes of which we are one, and we can only see these balances because we're in the universe where there is intelligent life. Fair enough. I think that means you can't prove God through anthropic balances. But it's still an amazing universe to, to live in. And people like Paul Davis, not a Christian, will say maybe this is saying that there's a deeper story to the universe. And then... What about intelligibility? The fact that we can understand the laws of physics. Albert Einstein once said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. I mean, why should we here on a Sunday afternoon in Portland be talking about the universe back to 10 to the minus 43 of a second and it's intelligible to us? Well, I mean, I hope it's intelligible, just a little bit to us. Why should the mathematics of our minds resonate with the mathematics of the universe in such a wonderful way that we can understand this? For John Polkinghorne, former particle physicist in Cambridge and then Anglican priest, it was that resonance between the God who was the source of mathematics and the God who was the source of our minds that pointed towards a deeper story to the universe. And then what about this sense of awe? Now, those of you who are scientists and engineers will know that most of the time, science is boring, tedious, um, frustrating, and doesn't work. But there are moments, core look at that moments, as one scientist put it, where you go, wow, where you go, gosh. In my area in astrophysics, not about the beauty of the universe alone, but that underneath this vast universe are certain laws which are beautiful, elegant, and far simpler than we ever imagined them to be. I'm to my final point now. And that is, uh, how can God be known? God's been missed out on the slide in the translation. So you might say, okay, you can't prove God, you can't disprove God. Uh, maybe uh, there are one or two pointers towards God, but where does the God bit come from? You've talked about the science and its evidence. Is, is the faith bit, well, to use the words of Professor Dawkins, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Is the Christian faith that when you come in through the doors of a church, you take your mind out and throw it away? No, I don't believe that. I became a Christian at the age of 17, not because of the science, but because I read the story of Jesus, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And I could not explain that evidence in any other way than this was God walking the pages of history. And so when John begins his gospel, he doesn't begin it by saying, by the way, I knew this bloke called Jesus. John does an amazing philosophical synthesis. He takes two areas of thought in the ancient world. One is the Greek understanding of the word logos, the scientific rationality behind the universe. 
and he takes it with the Jewish understanding of the Word, which is God's personal activity in creation. So, you remember in Genesis 1, God said, and it was so. And John puts the two together, and he writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you're kind of, wow, John. You're saying that the scientific rationality behind the universe is there because of the personal action, creation of God. That's an amazing thing to say. And then just as you are recovering from this philosophical synthesis, John writes, and the Word became flesh, became a human being, and lived amongst us full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, writes John, the only Son, Jesus. He has made Him known. Now, I need to say that final point in order that you understand that my joy in science and Christian faith is not because I use the science to prove God. It's because I see the science from the perspective of a God who has spoken, revealed Himself supremely in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Nazareth, something that I came to at the point of age of 17. So, I've shared a little bit about the universe. I've shared a little bit about the Big Bang Theory. I've shared a little bit about some of the big questions that scientists are asking. And I've shared a little bit about my own faith in Jesus Christ. Hope that's all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Back to, uh, I mean, I understood everything you said, but <laughs> That's John more than I got did. lost, I think, on some of the one to the 42, you yeah, were saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. why, yeah. don't, why don't you start? <laughs> Is this on? Oh. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, well, one clarifying thing might be helpful just to talk about the, the physics first. You mentioned that the clustering of galaxies is interesting for how we know how yes. the early universe yes. began. Can yes. you say a few more things about that? Yeah, sure, absolutely, John. Very, one of the big uh, things that we do at Durham University in the northeast of England where I work, my colleagues in the physics department have a number of supercomputers. And what they do in those computers is that they simulate universes. So they take some fairly uh, simple physics, gravity, and uh, the mixture of the universe between visible matter, hydrogen gas, and dark matter and dark energy. And you put those in, and then you grow universes. You simulate you universes. Yeah. And what you see is that the first thing that develops are clusters, strings of matter, out of which then galaxies form, and clusters of galaxies form. And then they take the simulations, and they compare them to observations. And that gives them a handle on what the universe was like. But one of the really important observations in recent years has been the pattern, not just of galaxies, but the way that they cluster. And that gives you a very good handle on particularly what the dark matter might be, and in a sense how this process of the Big Bang works. And so this is, a, I mean, in one sense, it's not an exact science, you know, you don't look at the universe and um, take an observation and immediately get a readout saying uh, this, that, and the other. This is about comparing models, theory, with observation. And things like the amount of helium and the way that galaxies cluster are particular 
good handles on whether your model is right and particularly what the ingredients to go into the model are. Now, there is a, there is a technical problem with this, and that is that, in a sense, you know, just like um, you know, a recipe for apple pie, um, if you don't get it right, you can just keep m messing with the mixture until you try and get it right. So you've got to be careful about doing this just in order to get the right answer or what you think is the right answer. But that clustering of galaxies gives you a very good understanding of the physics or a test of the physics, and that's how you do it. Yeah, when you talk about that, this isn't proof, it's, um, I love the phrase, the best model that interprets yeah. the evidence. Yeah. That's uh, what I'm gonna use often when I'm in a debate with my wife now. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, but about the model, just in like plain language, how surprised would astrophysicists be if we discovered it was wrong? Yeah. Um, I think we'd be surprised, but not, um, um, it's not unexpected that models change. Now, uh, the, the kind of sense of um, part of the process of science is about weighing evidence. And part of what you train a scientist to do is how to weigh observational evidence. And what you've always got with a model is evidence for and some evidence against or unanswered questions. And the skill of science is to make a judgment of confidence about how you weigh the evidence. And the media aren't terribly good at that at times because they'll often take a debate like climate change and they'll have one person with one view and then another person with a completely different view and it'll be a straight. Um, how you weigh the evidence is very important. Now, cumulatively, for 40, 50 years, the evidence for the Big Bang has been pretty good. The model itself has gone through changes in detail, um, but it's, one can never rule it out. And in 1998, something happened which was completely unexpected. And that was observations about what the future of the universe was going to be. And most people thought that the universe would either slow down in its expansion, or there was enough mass in it that it would reverse and collapse into the opposite of a big bang, a big crunch. Um, but what the observations in 1998 by Saul Perlmutter and Adam Schmidt and Brian Rice and their research group showed was the universe was accelerating in its expansion. No one expected that. I mean, no one, no one had even predicted it. Is that why dark energy became a thing? That's because, that's exactly right. Yeah. So that's why we know the dark energy's there. Now, what's happened there is you had the Big Bang model into which you've put an extra yeah. factor. And then you, you build models like that, and eventually, do you get to a stage where you've got so many qualifiers in it that you have to reject the model itself? And sometimes that happens in science. But at the moment, even with the dark energy, you can have very unexpected things. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, great friend of, uh, Darwin said that science is humility before the facts. Um, sometimes a bit more complicated than that, but overridingly, you say, whatever the data says, we hold these models tentatively. They're never the end of the story. They're provisional, they're never exhaustive, and at times they may need to be completely changed. One of the things that I think um, for, for, many, for many Christians, faith and science have sort of been at war with each other. Yes. And for both atheists and for Christians, I think their position can reach such a sort of a dogma, right, yes. that, that everything teeters on proving their point. Um, therefore, for the atheist, you know, I don't need God, I have science, this is absolutely true. And then, you know, for the Christian, I have to prove it yes, out of the Bible. Yes. But what I, 
what I hear you saying is by holding it together, right, that, that I have this faith, but, but I also can let science do what science does. That's right. How, how have you seen people move, I guess, from both atheism and from sort of a Christianity that is very afraid of science? Yes. Thank you, Rick, really important. And I think there are three or four areas that have been really important, not just, I mean, for me and for, for one or two others. I think the first is just um, understanding, again, the history of this. So the conflict model is only about 100 years old. It was created in the 19th century by Huxley, Thomas Henry Huxley. Um, and it was created, it wasn't there, he created this conflict between science and faith because he wanted to move science out of the control of the church, which in the UK, the, the Anglican church was very much in control. And so then that led to a rewriting of, of Galileo and Darwin in terms of a conflict model rather than um, what the reality was. And the reality was that Christian faith gave a great deal to the growth of science. Galileo pointed his telescope at the universe because he was a Christian, and he wanted to see what God had done. And so I think recapturing the history rather than just leaving the myths of history there are important. I the think second, God's mad that's right. At this conversation. Indeed. I mean, maybe it was six days. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, does does the church does the church have an ark? Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm wondering wondering about. <laughs> I saw oh, a rainbow earlier. This so floats. We're good. Don't worry. We, <laughs> we made sure this floats. <laughs> the, the, second, the second thing is um, something about seeing those who are scientists with genuine Christian faith. One of the things that Professor Dawkins struggles with are those scientists who have genuine faith, of which there are many, actually. And the media picks out those who don't often. But, um, and one of the things for me as a young scientist was to see people like um, John Polkinghorne and John Horton, who led environmental science, committed Christian people. And incarnation is really important within scientists themselves. The third thing is not to fear science. And often we feel that because of the conflict model, we have to almost defend God. Now, C.H. Spurgeon, great preacher, was once asked to defend God, and he said, what are you talking about? He said, that's like being asked to defend a lion. We don't have to defend the Bible, we don't have to defend God. But often we, we have that initial kind of fear about it, and I think that means that we lead into conflict. And I think that the final point for me is actually understanding what the Bible really says, rather than what we've imposed upon Scripture. And I touched on, on Genesis 1, and I think sometimes what we've done is we've taken a Western view of history, and we've imposed it on a, on a on a, a book of the Middle East where some of our questions are important, but they're not the primary questions for the biblical authors. And so, um, um, I mean, often I, I'm a biblical Christian. I, I just like to sit down with people and I'll read the Bible with them. Something as simple as that. For my sisters and brothers in the church who have a six-day creationist view, let's read the Bible together. For some of my atheistic friends who are scientists, I'll say, or my friend Tom McLeish will often say to his fellow scientists, um, have you ever seen these passages from Job and the way they talk about creation? So I think there's great value in Scripture, but I think um, history... Um, witness, incarnational witness, not fearing, and then actually reading the Bible as it is, rather than what we think it says. And that was important for me at the age of 17. I mean, up to the age of 17, I'd never read the Bible for myself. 
I just believed what people told me about the Bible. And when I read it for myself, I mean, this is your work, John, forgive me, but, you know, it's the, the kind of, you know, the great work that you're doing with the Bible Project is so important, actually just reading Scripture. Um, well, speaking of Scripture, so Romans 8 says, creation is subjected to frustration and will be liberated from bondage and decay, yeah. brought into freedom and glory. And we know in the Revelation, John is talking about a new heavens and a new earth. Yeah. So I would love to hear from you. You're an astrophysicist and a theologian. I'm sure you've just ruminated on what is new creation. What are your, do you have any thoughts for us on, um, on that topic? I have a few, but uh, um, uh, uh, whether they're coherent or not, we'll <laughs> see. Um, one of the fascinating things about cosmology since 1999 is that we know that the universe is destined to futility. So we know the universe is going to accelerate in its expansion, and that leads to it cooling and what's called heat death. And at that point, intelligent life is not possible. Now, we don't need to worry, because that's in about 30 billion years or so, so we're all right for dinner this evening, but the end of the story is really important to any narrative. And one of the things, uh, I'm, I'm a Methodist, by the way, so I'm under contract always to mention the name of John Wesley in every <laughs> talk that I do. And on this point, it's actually really relevant. Most of the time it's not, but on this point it is. Uh, and Wesley talked about the importance of new creation. He talked about the importance of new creation within the person and then the community, the church, but he also then began to talk about um, the new creation of the physical universe stuff. And so preaching on that passage from Romans, he once preached a sermon where he talked about whether there be cats and dogs in heaven. And that's a really important point because it's about the non-human creation. And so when John talks in Revelation about the new creation, it's a new heaven and a new earth. So new creation for me is the central category of hope in the New Testament. And the basis for that, the evidence for it for me, and the example of it is the resurrection body of Jesus. So Paul says that the resurrection is the first fruits of that which is to come. And one of the fascinating things about the resurrection body of Jesus is that it's physical, but it's more than physical. So Jesus takes fish and eats it. He says to Thomas, look at the nail holes. And yet he appears in rooms with locked doors. He seems to appear to people at the same time in different places. Um, there's even this extraordinary story about him going on a long walk with a couple of disciples to Emmaus and they don't recognize him. And I mean, I've heard some really bad sermons over the years about why they didn't recognize Jesus. You know, if you plot the sun in this part of the sky and Emmaus was, you know, they were walking into the sun and they didn't have sunglasses and uh, all that. I don't believe any of that. What Luke is saying is that this Jesus was the same, but different. And so when we get to, back to the question that you rightly asked, New creation for me is, has continuity and discontinuity. God's purpose is not to throw away this world, but to transform it into a new creation. And that is going to be more than rather than less than. C.S. Lewis, a number of years ago, wrote, wrote a book called Shadowlands. And he said, most Western Christians believe that when we die, a kind of grayish soul gets out of our body and leaves this world of color and physicality and goes up onto clouds um, and ha exists in this kind of shadow lands. And Lewis said, that's completely the wrong way round, he said. This is the shadow lands. The new creation is more physical, more colorful, more exciting, more real, less limiting 
than this creation. So I'm not worried that science says that the universe is destined to futility, uh, because God's purposes are to transform this creation into something better. And salvation for Christians is not that we're taken back to the Garden of Eden. Salvation for Christians, in the words of an old hymn, it begins with the tale of a garden and ends with a city of gold. That the new creation is better than this creation. Similarly, you were talking about Jesus in his glorified body post-resurrection, and it makes me wonder about sort of space and time yes. and the kingdom of God. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, when we read those, Jesus appeared here and then he appeared here, you know, my mind goes to movies and magic and that sort of thing. But in reality, could he be moving through dimensions of time? Could the kingdom of God actually be like here now? Yes. Multiverses, yes. I don't know. Yes. Like, yes. you're Rick. the guy. That's why. Well, I, this is why you're here, actually. <laughs> I'm glad we're dealing with all the easy questions this afternoon. Um, um, I, I actually agree with you, and I think you've expressed it very well. Um, one of the things that we've learned in the early universe is that the universe perhaps began with more dimensions than just three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So there are models of the universe with 11 dimensions of space-time. And what happens in the early universe is that the three dimensions of space and one dimension of time crystallize out to form our universe. Now, if we imagine that that crystallizing out doesn't mean that God crystallizes out with it, that God actually is bigger than our three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, then I think your model is actually really helpful just to think about how God is, no, is not constrained by space and time in the way that we are. A number of years ago, uh, a, a mathematician called Abbott wrote a book called Flatlands, and he imagined a world as a two-dimensional space. So what would beings look like if they lived just in two dimensions rather than three? And you had to design houses in two dimensions, and it's very good now. Imagine that you've got people living in two dimensions, and then you have a three-dimensional being inhabiting more dimensions. Well, first of all, um, you can actually um, interact in lots of different places at the same time. Certain things can happen which the two-dimensional folk would have no idea what was going on. So for, imagine you took a, a, you took a football, sorry, a soccer ball, I should be careful here. Take a soccer ball. We've got footballs too. Oh, you've got football, that's good. Um, and you passed, uh, uh, that sphere through the two-dimensional world. The two-dimensional folk would, would kind of notice a little point appear from nowhere. And then that point would grow to a circle, and then that circle would get smaller, and then it would disappear. And your two-dimensional friends would say, what on earth is going on there? We know that it happened, but we don't understand why. Now, if God is more than our experience of space and time, I think the resurrection body is a, giving us a clue that there's a more than dimensional experience in new creation, and that God is more than that. And that's a way, I think, of saying that time is real, because within the Christian view, we believe that God is in trinity, in relationship. I mean, I think relationships need some kind of temporality to it, but it's not constrained temporality. That means that when I go on the plane tomorrow night, it's going to be a long 10 hours 
to get to where I'm going. So yeah, I think that's really helpful. So when you think about the new earth, it's gonna be physical, yeah. but not quite like we understand yeah. physics now. Yeah. Um, you mentioned heat death in 30 billion years. I heard our yeah. star is gonna yeah. explode in like five billion years. That's right. So we got that on the clock. Um, is it just physically possible? Like, does physics have the flexibility enough for, for eternality to exist and for homeostasis to exist in a way, I guess I would imagine a new creation needing, needing to be. Um, I think, I think it, um, the answer is yes, with one or two qualifications, if I may, John. The first is that um, if this universe is creation, then the creator um, has the freedom to do unusual things. And we know from the biblical record that God um, works both by process in a hidden way and in particular events. So God's sustaining of the universe is there always in the background, maintaining the physical laws. And then this is the God who also uh, works in particularity of events like the resurrection, uh, like the incarnation of Jesus. There's a particularity about how God works. So when we talk about the movement to new creation, for me, God is in the process of transformation now, but then there will be a moment, and I think this is what, what the Bible rightly emphasizes in the eventedness of the second coming of Jesus. So I know there are lots of theologians who don't like the word intervention, and I can understand why, but there is, for me, a, a kind of particular action at times that God does, and that at that point there's a discontinuity and God comes into the physical process and transforms um, in a sea change kind of way into a new creation. But I, I don't think you need um, stasis or atemporality for this. I think you already seem to have built into our understanding of the laws of physics multidimensionality, which allows you to have the same thing um, without going to atemporality. And what do you mean by atemporality versus multi? Sorry, forgive me, I may have misunderstood the question. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I, the, the view often that Christians, when they talk about eternity, think eternity is lack of time, ah, mm -hmm. no time. Okay, or never-ending time, I suppose. Never-ending time, I think, is, is better. Mm -hmm. But it, eternity in Scripture is, is also about the quality of relationship. Mm. It's not just about length. Yeah. It's about um, the intensity of relationship mm. with God, the intensity of the presence of God, yeah. the intensity of, um, you know, so that in worship, for example, we get, a, again, a glimpse of this, those of you who are Christians. Um, in worship, I can, I can lose a sense of time because of the intensity of worship with the Creator, with the God who by His Holy Spirit is moving amongst us. Now, you know, I still then, at the end of worship, however good it's been, I still have a sense that it's, you know, it's gone on for quite some time. And if you're a musician leading worship, you're kind of looking up at that clock all of the time. But there's an intense experience which often takes you beyond a length of time as a controlling factor. So I'm trying to find ways of expressing um, that time is important to God. Because if you have a view of eternity which is no time at all, you think to yourself, well, Lord, why did you put time into the universe to begin with? Um, and was it just a mistake, a big oopsie kind of thing, you know, to give us a universe like this? I don't think so. Um, there's something about the gift of space and time mm -hmm. which is important. Um, 
I, I mean, a lot of this is speculation. Please don't see it any more than that, because Scripture just gives us little glimpses here, and we're trying to, to use our minds to think about these things. Augustine once famously said, I understand time completely until I start thinking about it. And that's a, that's a pretty good kind of caution to us all on this. So, yeah. Was part of your question the science? Can science foresee a future without oh. entropy? Like without... Well, yeah. oh, mm -hmm. gosh, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my predecessors in the job that I do now and very, uh, a very distinguished New Testament theologian called Tony Thistleton, uh, written a, a very large commentary on 1 Corinthians 15, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians as a whole, but on particularly 1 Corinthians 15, argues or makes the suggestion that in this world, the flow of time is coupled with decay, entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, disorder increases. What if in the new creation, the flow of time, as Paul seems to indicate, might be coupled not with decay, but flourishing? Now, I don't quite know, I'm not an expert on the second law of thermodynamics, um, uh, but is there a way of thinking about the flow of time which is not the reversal of the second law of thermodynamics, but is about um, flourishing? And I think one of the areas of science which is really interesting, and we're just putting our toe into it, is in complexity. And what happens when systems get together in relationship? And I mean, can I, can I make a small confession here? I was trained as a physicist, and physicists are very arrogant. So I used to believe that physics was the only proper science in the universe. Chemistry was for people who couldn't do physics. <laughs> Biology was for people who couldn't do chemistry. And I won't even tell you what I thought of sociology. But now I have repented. Because one of the things is when atoms get together in a relationship, something new emerges, which only chemistry can, can study. And when molecules get together in living cells, something new appears, which only biology can study. And when living human beings get together in complex relationships, new things appear, which only sociology can study. And part of that is in relationship, there, are, there is always creativity. Now, it might be that in new patterns of relationship, creativity rather than decay comes out of it. And that kind of, there's an inkling of that, isn't there, within Scripture, mm -hmm. that when you reconcile relationships, when communities are truly fully human, they become not destructive but creative. If you, you could think of how science has stretched your faith yeah. and how faith has stretched your science. Yes. Maybe as we, and then maybe one more yeah, yeah. from you. Um, I mean, I, I grew up, and the big struggle for me as a, as a young Christian was um, I held to a six-day creationist view of Genesis. And there was a stretching of that view by the science that I was studying. And particularly the, the challenge for me was, was I letting go of orthodoxy by becoming an astrophysicist? Now, at the end of the day, it wasn't the science that um, led me to a non-60-day creationist view. It was actually an understanding the nature of Scripture. But I think there have been moments where science has provoked questions for me about how I interpret the Bible. Stress provoked rather than dominated how I read the Bible. 
Because if you remember, the Newtonian clockwork universe, remember Newton and his, his laws and, you know, theologians took that, swallowed it, and then said, well, God can't poke his finger into the clockwork mechanism, therefore miracles can't be important. That was the way that science dominated biblical thinking. Um, I'm not talking about that, I think that's a danger, but I think science can be part of the conversation in that, in terms of faith. And I think science has also been really important in, and I talked a little bit about it this morning, about the sense of awe, the, the sense of what J.B. Phillips a number of years ago called, your God is too small. Um, so that working with science and a world which is surprising, subtle, supple, um, uh, mysterious, that stretches my view of God, stretches the imagination. Um, and I think um, faith has questioned science in a number of ways. So faith comes to science, I think, and says, um, how do we use science for good rather than just selfishness and evil? I think faith comes to science and says, um, out of this science when we want to go gosh and to whom do we give thanks? Faith gives a context of gratitude for the joy of science. And so for me, um, science is a gift from God, which I receive as gift to be used, but to be used responsibly. And, and because it's gift, that doesn't mean also that just like a parable that Jesus told, because I'm so worried about the consequences of science, the only thing that Christians should do is bury the talent in the ground and say, this is far too risky, let's not get involved in it. So, faith for me is to say, we can take risks in science. It's, it's there to be used, and what I don't want to do is um, on the day of judgment, the Lord say, I've given you this gift of science and you've not used it. Even though there's a risk to it. Seems to me that that's some of the ways that it's helped. Okay, last question. Yes. Um, so, the story of the Bible, one of the storylines is God creating humans yeah. to rule on his behalf. To rule creation. Yeah. Um, and we just saw a picture of how massive creation actually is. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Christians should want to be an interplanetary species? Yeah. And I'll put two, two questions in one. Um, <laughs> are there aliens out there? Yeah. Um, it would be, John, it would be, it would be so crass of me at this point to say, well, actually, I've written a book about that, and it's called, uh, <laughs> Sweet. And it's called uh, Science, Religion, and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. But let me tell you what the book says to the second question, and that is the book is 250 pages, which basically comes out with I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's well worth the read, of course, and you'll find it in all bargain basements of Amazon at the moment um, on it. I mean, scientifically, I'll take the, the second bit first. Um, science on the question of alien life is still the jury's out. One of the great things about the last 30 years have about been our discovery of exoplanets, planets beyond our own solar system. Um, and many of those we've found are Earth-like planets. So you might say, well, you've said there's 100 billion stars, 100 billion galaxies. Um, if a lot of these stars have planets, then people pause and say, there must be life. I don't doubt that, but beware of, of then saying life in the same breath as intelligent life. 
Because if I can put it like this, it's a long way for an amoeba to an accountant. <laughs> or, well, I mean, you know, maybe. Um, but there's difference between basic life and intelligent life. And so I think myself, if you pushed me, um, I think there is life elsewhere in the Milky Way galaxy, but it's probably unlikely that there's intelligent life. Uh, purely as a scientist, I'm saying that. Um, there may be intelligent life in other galaxies, but then there's a problem because if, say, a civilization in Andromeda, another galaxy, sent a message saying, hello, is there anyone there? That message would take four million years to reach us. If we then reply saying, we're here, who are you? That would take another four million years to get back. That's not a very interesting conversation <laughs> at the end of the day. And so there could be intelligent life and we'd never know that it's there. But theologically, I don't have a problem. You know, God is the one who is an extravagant creator. There are many parts of the natural world on this earth that I don't fully understand, which are part of God's creation. Uh, more life, um, intelligent life, would, for me, just be a fulfillment of the extravagant creator that I see. Now, there are issues about what's the significance of the Jesus event on this earth to other intelligent life, and that's another story and probably a, another lecture at some point. But I'm intrigued to come back to the first point of the question, which is really, really helpful. It's fascinating to know that the first people who speculated about other worlds were Christian theologians. And they did that because they felt our human intellect should not constrain God. God could do whatever He wanted to. And in fact, the only way that we could find out what God had done would be to look at the universe, to explore it. And so I do think it's a Christian responsibility to explore the universe that God's given. And so I'm a great uh, advocate and proponent of programs that search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I think the James Webb Telescope will do some of that, and rightly so. But you also coupled it with a very important point, and that was environmental responsibility. So there's a number of, a number of people thinking at the moment of, you know, this earth is destined not just to, um, to the sun going um, white dwarf, uh, red giant in five billion years, but actually we're messing up the environment at such a rate. Why don't we go to other worlds and terraform them? You know, transform the atmosphere of Mars into, it, into something else. I think there are two problems for me on that. The first is that we know in terms of our own human history, the people who move are always the rich, leaving behind the poor to the mess that the rich have often created. So there's a justice issue there. And there's also an environmental cosmic responsibility. So that stewardship in Genesis is not just about rule or dominion. It's also about keeping, the word that Genesis uses, the garden, respecting it maintaining it, sustaining it. And there's an interesting question, which is, if there are microbes deep under the permafrost on Mars, what should be our role as stewards of that biodiversity, just as it is on this Earth? And, um, and I think that's a really important question. And so, we can't simply use the resources of space for our own selfishness and our own greed, but actually we need to find ways of talking together so that we can respect um, and keep and till uh, the resources of space uh, in a way that doesn't mean that we cause the same kind of abuse of the environment that we've done on the earth. Amen.
Last time I was up in space, it was so full of junk from <laughs> bug mates. Yes. Yeah, satellites, uh, everything. That's I right. couldn't even fly. <laughs> John, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for the Bible Project and all that you guys yeah. are doing there. We appreciate you. Can we give John Collins some love? And David, thank you so much for coming, for lecturing to us, and for sharing so much of your heart. We're really, really grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Wilkinson. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. This uh, will be online uh, tomorrow uh, for, uh, on demand as well if you want to share it. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, David will be here and available to talk to you afterwards as well Absolutely. for a little bit, I yeah. believe. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.